And greetings from the port of Bergen in Norway on an overlook here with the famous mariner and naval officer whose details I don't have because they didn't write them on the plaque. And the port of Bergen, of course, you will know is famous because the British came here in 1665 and tried to capture a fleet of Dutch vessels. The interesting thing about this port is that it is just full chock-a-block with OSVs, PSVs, and other uh, service vessels that go out into the North Sea. Uh, we are now in February and obviously they go out all year to service the offshore oil platforms. And what you learn from studying these vessels just a little bit is that they are Norwegian tough. They go out in any kind of weather. The terrible weather that ripped across the uh, U.S. and shut down the Northeast, including where I live in Rhode Island a couple of weeks ago, came through here with 80 knot winds. And a lot of these vessels were out in the field at that point. And uh, we're actually, uh, when we do our technical tour of the vessel here, they, they talk a little bit about being on board with 15 meter, uh, which would be over 50 foot waves and 80 knot winds. We're gonna do our first inspection of this UT standby vessel, emergency rescue and response vessel, which is at a dock in Marikoven, just outside of Bergen. As you can see, the weather changes fast here. So today our technical tour will be aboard this emergency response and recovery vessel, otherwise known as standby vessels. Uh, this one is called Ocean Tay. It's a Class A standby vessel originally built in 1992 in Norway at the Bratvag shipyard. And it is part of a class of vessels that are uh, platform supply vessels designed by Ulstein, also in Norway. The vessel is 63 meters overall. That's 206 feet with a 15 meter beam, which is about 50 feet of beam. The gross tonnage is 1,823 tons. She's powered by twin Bergen Rolls-Royce engines that deliver 5,000 horsepower on straight shaft drives to constant speed props. And that drives her along at 12 knots while sipping only about 100 gallons of fuel per hour. These 10 meter rescue boats are also built in Norway by Maritime Partners. They're 32 knot vessels powered by twin Yanmars and Hamilton water jets. They will automatically right if tossed upside down by a wave. So let's head on board. We'll start on the bridge deck with Chief Officer Don Quinn, who's going to give us a technical tour. The purpose of this vessel was emergency response. This vessel can take 300 casualties. In case there's a multi-evacuation of the platforms, we will be in position to recover the casualties. If they end up in the water, we have enough people on board to man both the watercraft and we would come to their rescue. You have uh, two rudders. When we're doing port operations, a lot of time we split the six, so we use the engines as well to steer the to steer the vessel, you know. This is your autopilot system. But this is a drop down Azipod thruster. You can do a 360, you know. So that, yeah, that could actually take the boat back into port by itself, could it? It could, yes. If a casualty is in the water with a personal locator beacon, this would give you a bearing of where the beacon is in relation to the ship. Your nav light panel, you know, once we go on location, we're there for 28 days. And then the only reason we go to port is for provisions, fuel, water, and crew change and then the vessel comes straight back out to location and resumes uh, standby duties. The maximum sea height I've probably seen on this vessel is probably 14 or 15 meters. She's, she's a, it's a good sea boat, it's a good sea vessel. Um, once, you, once you're confident in operating it, that weather is no problem, you know. If we're on station and we had a casualty in the water, we activate the MOB alarm. And then once we activate the MOB alarm, everybody will muster and we'll get the rescue crafts ready. This is a thing called a, a drenching system or a deluge system. You're close to the platform and there's a fire, let's say, on the platform. And you're, fight, you're helping to fight the fire, but the deluge system has pipe work going all the way around the vessel. So when we activate this, there's seawater coming through the pipes. Mm -hmm. And it's like a protection barrier to, right. put, to protect the ship, you know. Anything you need to find to do with life-saving or firefighting will be on this plan. 
Okay, now we're going down to the master's level. This is the master's day room and office. His bunk and his toilet inside here. These three cabins here are new because the vessel was converted before it became a standby vessel. But they converted it so it would be ready for standby duties. It's like a recreation room where the crew get an opportunity to relax and watch some TV. This is the eating area. We have the Bain Marie here. That's used for serving the food. This is hello a, there, Chef. Hi there. Oh, say hello. <laughs> <laughs> so this is your big chill. Fresh fruit and veg and milk and stuff. All general dry, dry stores. And then this is our freezer. This is our anchor setup. Two anchors, one port, one starboard. If we take casualties on board, and they're contaminated. They can be contaminated outside, but if they need to take a shower, this is the shower area. And the rescue craft will bring the casualties to the rescue zone. Then they come in here and they're triaged. Mm -hmm. So depending on how serious their injuries are, they'll be either put into the seating area, which their, their injuries aren't too bad. This is for casualties as well. So after they're being treated and they seem to be okay, they have the opportunity to rest here. So all the casualties, depending on how serious their injuries are, have um, they'll be assessed by the AMA and they'll be taken into this area for treatment. So the res rescue craft will come in, transport the casualty onto the vessel, and then they can go through this door. This is where the triage place I showed you earlier. But if they're contaminated with oil due to the oil sp an oil spill, they can be decontaminated here. All around the vessel, there's the deluge system or drenching system. It, it sprays out water to create a barrier between you and the fire, between the vessel and the fire. What happens here is that the, the crane that we have hooks on here, lifts this up, we deploy it over the side, and it's like a fishing net for humans, if, if I can best describe it. It's just like a big Jason's cradle. We have a heli spot here. If we maneuver the vessel correctly, this is the safest location to get a casualty off. Two 25 man life rafts. HRU is the hydrostatic release unit. If we were in a, a position where we'd have to launch the rescue craft immediately, when the rescue craft hits the water, when you put on the light tension, it keeps a certain amount of tension on the wire so the boat isn't rocking all over the place. If we're at sea and we have no power to the davids, these are like an independent power pack. But let's say we had an abandoned ship scenario, then we can also use these just to get away from the vessel because we would like to think these are our number one life raft. The controls are very similar for the daughter craft. See the bow line here? You can adjust the tension on that also. So if you recover the daughter craft and this is slack, the daughter craft might move. But if you take up the tension on the bow line, It'll keep the dog craft in a safe position until it's sitting in the cradle again, you know. Right, the purpose of these boats, when the mothership is providing cover at one oil platform for rescue, we deploy one of these. And this can go to another platform and provide cover. This is a radar. And then you have your VHF as well. You have one here. And you have a VHF here. This is a, obviously a portable one. And this is a direction finder again. Yeah. I remember I showed you on the bridge earlier, it'll give you a bearing to a casualty. Like if we had to transfer personnel to shore side, they come in here. If, if it ever happened that the boat capsized, it will rewrite itself. But these boats can carry a lot, you know. And they also have a range, so you could get to port. Yeah. The, 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 the theory behind it is that if the daughter craft couldn't be recovered by the mothership, that it could make its own passage to port. So that wraps up part one of our technical tour of this emergency standby vessel in Bergen, Norway. And part two is a tour with the chief engineer of the engine room and the cement tanks. Anyone who has worked on a large yacht or been in yacht engine rooms you gotta check this out because it is astounding.